my name is Don Parkinson, and I'm a Senior Consultation Specialist with Atkins Realis. Today we are continuing our series of live stream topics on the Northern Road Link Project as it moves through the Provincial Environmental Assessment and Federal Impact Assessment processes. The topics we are covering parallel our project activities, so we hope these will help our viewers and listeners better understand the project and provide input along the way. And with me today is my usual co-host, Jennifer Ashawazagai Pereira, my colleague and uh, an Indigenous Engagement and Traditional Knowledge Specialist at Atkins Realis. Jennifer is a member of Henvey Inlet First Nation, which is located on the French River south of Sudbury and works with me on our projects across Canada. Hello, Jen. How are you today? Good day, Anin. I am good. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Busy day for you and I. Um, it's just one of those days, as we were talking about before. Um, <laughs> but today we're going to talk about the aquatic habitat studies that we're doing uh, as part of the environmental and impact assessments. Um, so let's get started. Um, we'll go run through, I guess we'll start things off by running through um, our second slide here, which is uh, explains uh, the topics for today. So we're gonna we're gonna start off with talking about the objectives of the aquatic habitat field studies. We're gonna talk about what will be studied. Then we're gonna get into the specific activities associated with the field surveys, including fish habitat assessment, conventional fish capture, and uh, benthic invertebrate sampling. Then we're gonna talk about criteria and indicators, and potential uh, mitigation methods, and then finally wrap up with how you can get in contact with us. So, with that, let's talk a little bit about the study objectives. So, as with the objectives of some of the other studies that are done, again, we're trying to establish a baseline. And um, we're doing... The first two things are to identify and consider the impacts of the project on aquatic habitat and then identify and consider the impacts of aquatic habitat on the project. And then in a general sense, we'll be providing recommendations for, or not in a general sense, but in a specific sense, providing recommendations for, for minimizing those negative environmental health or social project constructability or economic effects related to aquatic habitat impacts during construction and operation and maintenance of the actual road. In terms of what we're going to study, we're going to look at uh, a number of different things. We're going to look at habitat availability. And um, so when we talk about habitat availability, we talk about both habitat quantity and habitat quality and uh, habitat quantity it's when we when we look at that we're, we're doing what you call a quantitative assessment so your quantitative means numbers right so we're looking at um, changes in numbers and and so the question might be well what numbers well we look at the project we look at the the land and water that it travels over and then we look at what habitats are impacted, whether they're terrestrial, meaning on land, or aquatic habitat, water. So that's what we're talking about. So we would look at the foot, for example, the footprint of the project um, when it's completed, during construction, um, and identify what areas would be impacted, uh, what habitats might be lost based on permanent, on the permanent um what's built permanently as opposed to what's built on a, for, on a temporary basis. We also look at habitat quality and we look at this in a qualitative way, meaning not with numbers. So we're, we're looking at changes to the quality of spawning areas, rearing areas, so where, where the young are taken care of um, or overwintering uh, habitats for different species that are important, like brook trout, northern pike, walleye, lake sturgeon. And uh, 
We consider other species that may not be what you call criteria species, but species that are regularly consumed or, you know, or, or used um, uh, or harvested by community members. So these could be lake like pickerel. whitefish, pickerel. Yeah, pickerel, perch, you know, um, uh, cisco, burbot, sucker, longbow sucker, white sucker, lake chub. And then um, we also look at ha habitat sensitivity. When we talk about sensitivity, we, we talk about rating each water body with a with a descriptor, right? With a uh, like calling it rare, high, moderate, low, or no fish habitat. So we're describing the fish habitat based on its sensitivity, its dependence, the how how much the different fish species depend on their habitat, um, how rare certain types of habitat are, and the ability of of certain habitat to recover from change right so if it's very sensitive it may be hard to recover from even temporary uh, impacts to it so we'll also be looking at fish communities and this refers to the species and just three fish within a water body when we talk about when we use words like abundance we're talking about impacts on um population um on the numbers right on the on the numbers of different species so mortality meaning death of individuals resulting from activities related to the project the construction or operation of the project or direct or an indirect changes of the population to the population changes to the availability of that habitat you know if, if it's less available that particular habitat then that may affect the survival and reproduction of that specific species. And then we talk about distribution, and this relates to, uh, we call it the spatial configuration. So that's the different things. The area over which that species is is distributed, right? Where it ex the area over which it exists. When we talk about configuration, it could, it could talk about how connected these areas, how connected to each other these different fish habitat areas are. That's that's another part of, of distribution. Um, so we, we, distribution, we use a qualitative, a descriptive sort of assessment of, of changes to that may have occurred to the distribution through direct or indirect changes to fish or, fa uh, or, or fi to habitat or fish abundance. So again, looking at impacts of the project, see if it, it affects the distribution of different species. We look at spawning, that's another important area. Mm -hmm. Spawning, we look at effects of spawning activity of uh, on the spawning activity of the fish, and then the extent of, of spawning habitat present in the project area. So we do surveys to identify the spawning areas, um, hopefully the water crossing areas where for the road are away from these spawning areas. That's hopefully the intention. And um, we, because we want to limit direct and indirect impacts on spawning areas, because these are very important areas, particularly for, for certain species. And then That's right. last it's fairly but not sensitive. least, yeah, very sensitive. Yes. And then last but not least, we have, benthic invertebrates, Jen, and I know this is one of your favorite topics. Um, <laughs> these are little That little I had bugs. to look up prior. <laughs> <laughs> so benthic invertebrates are little spineless bugs, and I know Tony will want to jump in because I called them spineless, but I'm not trying to insult benthic invertebrates. I just mean they have no spine. That's why they're called invertebrates. So these little, these little guys are aquatic creatures or bugs that live in the bottom of water bomb they don't get a lot of credit these guys you know they're down Except there in the bottom they're go ahead jen they're doing the hard work down there <laughs> there's they're doing the just hard work to add down that there and snails and worms and then um larvae like dragonflies and beetles and dragonflies as you know are very important in the spring everyone is so happy to see the dragonflies when they come out because they are the heroes after black fly season. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and 
the the thing about benthic invertebrates and the reason why they are sampled so extensively in aquatic habitat surveys is because they're very good indicators of ecosystem health because they respond to changes in the environment so they're 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 that sort of indicator right the canary in a cold mine uh, in a coal mine um, as they describe that. Um, so they provide good indicators of ecosystem productivity and health. So when they look at benthic invertebrates, they look at the number of different species, so diversity, and then, yeah, and abundance, right? How many of different species? So if you get a very sort of diverse group of species and a, a high abundance of each species in in your samples, of benthic invertebrates, it usually indicates a very, very healthy sort of uh, aquatic ecosystem. So these are extremely important little guys. Um, and that's why uh, that work to collect those samples is such a big part of um, aquatic uh, habitat surveys. So moving on now to talk about the studies themselves, there's the, the fish habitat assessment part. And um, this is more descriptive. Um, so what we try to do in this case is characterize um, the water courses that we're looking at where the crossings occur. Um, so we identify the name, uh, the watershed that they sit within, um, the temperature. So we take physical, um, you know, physical measurements at, at where the crossing is of so temperature, um, flow rate, uh, velocity, uh, we do measurements of the channel to understand the um, physical characteristics of the channel. Um, so there's different measurements associated with that. Um, uh, we measure the depth of the water course at, at, at the crossing location. Um, the gradient of the stream, what I mean by that is really the slope of the stream. So it's usually measured measured in percentage, but it just, you know, how, the rate at which the the uh, elevation changes along the stream. Um, and then we, they make observations on the riparian vegetation, any barriers such as beaver dams to uh, fish, fish passage. So another group of, another one of the approaches for the fish studies is conventional fish capture. And um, so the fish community sampling is conducted uh, to determine the species present um, and how many there are um, at that sampling point. So this this is done typically, you know, in the areas where the water crossings would occur and they use different um, uh, different ways of capturing fish, whether it's hoop nets or angling, like actually fishing, um, seine nets, minnow traps, or they use uh, uh, electro fishing as well too, which is where you put a current through the water and the, the animals are sort of a, are briefly immobilized and they float to the surface and then they're netted, weighed and measured and then released again. So um, there's different approaches to fish capture and it's, and it, it's a fairly effective way of understanding um, fish communities, but there's a newer kind of or a newish kind of tool that's being used now on projects, and um, it's called eDNA sampling. and And what that involves is um, is taking a water sample basically, and then uh, and then having all the DNA in that sample um, analyzed to identify what was in that sample. So you get an idea of different species at different stages so this is becoming a really oh, popular uh, yeah it's pretty cool I've seen this in action and it's uh, it's it's pretty interesting and so and it's as you not, can imagine it's Jenny, not intrusive no it's not that's that's one of the like more that. popular you get to, uh, things about you get it, to right? know everybody you get to know everybody in the neighborhood yes yeah <laughs> that's that's a good way to describe it and so it, you get an idea from these samples about species richness, right? The number of species in a in a given area at a given time. And because what you do is you take that sample, and then it's filtered to separate the DNA. Then the DNA is goes off um, to the lab and is then analyzed. And based on the sequencing of the DNA, they can identify the specific species of organism. That's, wow. uh, you know, like uh, so it's CSI. pretty amazing. 
Yeah, water CSI. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, um, you know, this has turned out to be a pretty effective way of getting a better idea in combination, you know, with con conventional fish capture as well mm -hmm. um, and electrofishing, uh, other techniques. But um, it, it. Yeah, because the other way you get to know. You get to know the ages and, and kind of relative size of the fish. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. when you're looking That's at a right. DNA sample, you can't tell some of those things. So it's nice to have um, all of those opportunities to have a really good picture of what's in the, um, the water communities. You got it. So, you, you know, you're at that location, you're taking a water sample from the water column, right? So right in situ right in the water you take that sample and then you get a snapshot of what was there at the time and then you do that at a number of different locations you get a pretty good idea you do it over different seasons you get an idea of what's going on and then you combine that with the conventional fish capture you get that pretty good picture of 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 it allows you to define that pretty good pretty strong baseline actually um, mm -hmm. And then there's the benthic invertebrate sampling. We'll go back to your favorite Here topic, Jen. Benthic, benthic invertebrates. invertebrates. I like yes, saying that. Yes. Benthic Fun to say that. Yeah. So again, these are, these are blue bugs. Today. These are little spineless bugs, and um, they the reason why we they are sampled, as I mentioned before, is because they're good indicators of ecosystem health. And uh, so the way it's typically done is uh, they use a thing called a ponar, which if you can imagine is like a uh, two scoops on either side and they're sort of like a claw, is it like a claw thing, like a claw. So they're, they're triggered to close when they hit something. So what they do is they drop this down on a rope, for example, and then it hits the bottom of the river or lake and then closes and then, um, closes closes up and then hopefully you've got a, a pretty good grab of mud and then you pull that back up and dump it in a bucket and then uh, uh, those samples get sent off to um, to labs and then the experts in benthic invertebrates pick through the samples and identify a certain number of uh, take a certain number of individuals Benthic, individual benthic invertebrates and identify them to species, which is not easy work. It's very detailed work because there's sometimes very subtle differences between the different kinds of bugs that you get. And then they do, um, they count how many of each species they find. And then they use that to generate what's called the diversity index, which provides sort of an idea to, um, to uh, technical people as to ecosystem ecosystem health so that's basically how that uh, how that works now with the aquatic habitat studies um, uh, the valued components are our fish habitat and fish and aquatic species including species at risk now remember the valued components are the things that are that are studied that are important mm -hmm. have been identified as being important right and then then you have indicators associated with the valued components. So, the different fish species that that um, that we're looking at, among others, as part of this work, is walleye, brook trout, northern pike, lake whitefish, burbot, yellow perch, common white sucker, lake sturgeon, lake chub, as well. And um, so, when we look at the indicators, so the indicators are measures, right? Ways of indicating. Um, uh, you have to do you have to do measures in order to be able to see if there's impacts, right? So indicators could include habitat quantity, the distribution or connectivity to habitat and migration, because again, some species move a lot, right? At different depending on their stage of life. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know it gives uh, so survival, reproduction, and abundance are again indicators of fish of of uh, fish and aquatic species and then there's the habitat side of things where we look at water quality right we take a water sample of where the water crossing would be which is where the impact would be to the water course because the road is crossing it we look at the physical habitat conditions we look at the benthic invertebrate community so those are the indicators those are the ways of measuring potential impacts 
Now, as we get close to the end here, there's the hopeful side of things, which is the potential mitigation methods, because even though there may be impacts from projects, um, there are known um, mitigation methods, and these mitigation methods are identified quite early in the process, and then they get refined over time and much more specific and then end up being taking the form of uh, commitments and monitoring requirements to ensure that what was anticipated in terms of impacts isn't isn't a surprise and that mm -hmm. uh, all efforts are being made to limit those impacts again that's what mitigation means right limiting those impacts so that could take a number of different methods so uh, different, a number of different approaches. So for example, you could look at different alternative locations for gravel pits and quarries and for other facilities. Like if um, maybe a construction camp has been identified to be placed in a certain area, but there might be, it might be too close to a water course that's a sensitive habitat for a particular species. Um, then maybe you might want to move the construction camp to another location, right? So all these things are sort of kept in mind. Um, you can, when it comes to watercourse crossings, you you want to design them to um, to uh, adapt to climate change, it's where maybe flow rates might be increased. They're they're because events, um, uh, rainfall events, might be more extreme um, than previously mm -hmm. so you might you know end up with a design for a culvert that's bigger than maybe what you need based on current current uh, weather patterns but you don't want to cause damage down the road where the culvert might blow out right um so you put in a larger culvert to accommodate for for climate change and then other techniques that you see all the time, Jen, you know, on, on when you're driving along the highway or whatever, is is the use of um, stone, like riprap type stone or, or sometimes armor stone, depends on, you know, whether you're talking about lakes or rivers or whatever, um, to mitigate erosion, right, to prevent erosion. So around the inlets or outlets of, of pipes, like culverts, you'll see them lined with uh, stone to prevent that soil loss from getting into the water course and affecting aquatic habitat. And then you could also um, design water course crossings to allow uh, fish passage to be easier and uh, like open bottom culverts, things like that, that are more fish friendly. So those are some, some potential mitigation methods. Other ones could be um, using different toppings for the road, um, different embankment material, designing the road in a different way in terms of its geometry, um, so that you could hand it could handle increases in rainfall intensity. Um, different grading techniques, so different ways of shaping the road to minimize soil loss or erosion. Um, you know, and designing the road with a grade to allow proper surface drainage so just proper basically proper design engineering design mm -hmm. so uh, so yeah lots of ways Jen to mitigate impacts on aquatic habitat um, and again as I said they get refined as time goes on right because as we get a better understanding of the baseline we get a better understanding as to um, how to prevent I have things. a question Don sure sure so how long uh, do we undertake these water studies to capture a really good baseline? Well, that's a great question, Jen. So typically you'll do this over multiple years, multiple mm -hmm. seasons, right? Because you're trying to get that snapshot. So I know um, on other projects, we've done them for three years uh, over multiple seasons, just so that we can get that indication of what's going on. Because you, you never know, one year might be an anomaly, right? It might be very different from from dry what's gone on or in the past. Yeah, or yeah, it yeah, have yeah more exactly. More precipitation than normal. Yeah. So that's so why you do multiple factors, years, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So you do multiple years to get a be a better picture and have more confidence in in your baseline, basically. 
Wow, okay. that was a lot of material to cover in a short period of time, wasn't it, it Jen? It was. You had a lot to say. Ooh. Yeah, and I yeah, learned about a, benthic invertebrates a... today. Yeah, don't forget that. There'll be a quiz uh, on the radio show this afternoon. <laughs> oh, no. <on> benthic invertebrates. <laughs> yeah, get ready. Start studying. <laughs> Dragonfly so larvae. That... <laughs> <laughs> so that wraps up today's discussion of the aquatic habitat studies. Um, we hope this was helpful and encourages you to join us again next week when we discuss the greenhouse gases and air quality studies. Don't forget to keep in touch with our project team members via the contact information available on our website, northernroadlink.ca. Miigwetch, and make sure to look out for project updates on social media and our website. All right. Chi miigwetch. Bamapi.